Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson. Here with me, as always, is my companion, Brian Gottlieb. And unfortunately, a little under the weather this week, Brian. Yeah, uh, maybe I have spent too much time on Arena and caught some kind of Arena sickness. Maybe I have got some worse sickness than that. Who knows? You can't get tested for anything these days. So nobody actually knows what's wrong with them. But uh, not not feeling great. Considering how good you are at the self-isolation, I doubt it's Corona, but yeah, like how, how could you, how could you possibly figure it out? I know that I, that's my expectation as well. I have certainly been hidden for a very long time in my home. I go out running. That's about my only possible point of exposure. But even then, like I run across the street if I see another human being. So it's not even like I'm in any kind of proximity. So who knows? Ultimately, we'll, we'll get through it and we will get through this cast and I am I couldn't miss it because I was too excited to talk about Ikoria. Too many things going on this week. Well, even still, you're going to try and say as few words as possible. I'm going to try, but you know I can't do that. Like as, right. as soon as we start saying things, I won't be able to shut up. Well, I hope you have a lot of water. You can hydrate and maybe take like a, a 7 p.m. nap when we're done with this. I don't know. I, I like that idea, although I may just be drafting instead. We'll see. Ew. Ew. Yeah, I was, I was going to talk about that but maybe we'll we'll save that for the end of the cast okay you, you've been posting a lot of draft decklists on Twitter and not a lot of standard decklists I was gonna open with standard but I I kind of feel like I know how you feel about this format already given the fact that you're just drafting a bunch it's complicated because it, it it's not that bad and I have played some standard and I have mostly enjoyed the games I have played and I think it's interesting and there's a lot going on. I just kind of love the limited format, like really love it. And I'm really having a good time with it. So it's not so much I dislike standard. It's just I'm I'm really enjoying playing limited right now. And my association with magic for me, it's very important. I lean into the things that I'm enjoying at any given second. And sometimes that's modern. Sometimes that's standard. Sometimes it's limited. But for me to keep my passion high, keep engaged, it's it's always been my way of engaging with magic. Just figure out what I really love about it and do that. And right now it's Ikoria Limited. I think it's in, an incredible limited format. It's so interesting. Okay. Well, that that's interesting. I agree with you that that is certainly how you should interact with magic and just your hobbies as a whole is like, you know, do the, do the thing that doesn't get boring, doesn't get old and actually keep you engaged and having fun. Don't feel pressured to do things because that's what all the other cool kids are doing. I know you're still playing standard, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like if you're having fun drafting, by all means do that, you know, like there are a lot of people who test for pro tours by playing cube draft or whatever, just because it's fun for them. So, well, I think you and I fall under the same category where we both have the capacity to learn a lot by observing and just seeing deck lists and seeing what's doing well, we can extrapolate True. so much from that without actually having to play the games. And like I said, I've played games. It's not like I've excluded the format. So I, I do have the experiential knowledge as well, but seeing how things have developed over the course of just a few days now, I have a very good idea about the general trends, what's strong, what's kind of a flash in the pan, and what I have my eyes on going forward. What was the best deck last weekend and what is the best deck today? Last weekend, I think it was the Loris Sacrifice decks. Today, it is not the Loris Sacrifice decks. Very quickly, that has changed. My guess is right now, the best deck is Teamer Reclamation, but yeah, <laughs> Fires is probably in the mix, and I'm just not equipped to accurately assess Fires <laughs> as part of the metagame. So uh, I am going to give it to Teamer Reclamation, but I will acknowledge that I am probably selling Fires short right now. What is what's the opposite of rose colored glasses? Is it like poo colored glasses? I, I guess so. I certainly have my poo colored glasses on when it comes to fires. Yeah, it's it's your new collected company, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. I certainly, you know, downplayed that deck a decent amount too. We were kind of on the same page. Now I think that deck has gotten uh, a decent amount better at least last season, and now Karuga changes things again, but maybe for the worse, honestly. But I mostly look at that as a response to like, you can't play ether gust anymore. And right now you don't even necessarily need to. So I think right. that fires is still in a good spot, but that could certainly come back to bite them at a future date. 
Yeah. So when it comes to fires, it's it's not even like I'm trying to say the deck isn't good. I, I just believe it's good. A hundred percent. I'm not good with the deck. That is what I'm acknowledging here. So I'm willing to write it off for my personal play. Uh, your point about Ether Gust is exactly what we said last week. We thought it was critical that decks adapt Ether Gust. It turns out there were other ways to hold down the decks that would have been very punished by Ether Gust. Among them, Loris. Loris did a very nice job exploiting those decks as well. I think that if Fires is just built this way and it's just focused around Karuga, there should be a punishment for it at some point. You shouldn't just be able to have only three mana permanents in your deck. Obviously, they cheat a little bit, Brazen Borrower, Bone Crusher Giant, but still, there has to be an exploit available, and it's probably coming from a deck that would otherwise be very punished by Aether Gust. Most likely, although... I don't know. Given given the way the metagame has shaped up, it's kind of difficult for me to believe that a deck like that could actually be good against the format as a whole. But we'll see. I mean, like Nissa Crisis always finds a way, right? Right. And there are Bant decks that are starting to pop up that I think have some promise. Uh, also, I think like Teamer Reclamation to some extent falls under that category. Now, granted, a lot of their key spells are blue, and they've picked up a very key blue spell in Shark Typhoon, which I think has done a ton for that archetype. But still, they have some vulnerability to Ether Gust when they're trying to resolve Wilderness Reclamation. Yeah, so let's uh, start by unpacking Luris, because if you're lagging a day or two behind, you might just be like, well, this is the best deck by far. How do you beat it? I'm looking at tournament results, and there's you know tournaments where it's like five of the top eight, six of the top eight, uh, a few different flavors of it too. And this is usually Rakdos Sacrifice, although there's some mono-black variations and some Orzhov ones where you're just one and two mana creatures, Luris in the sideboard, maybe you're comboing Luris with things like Dead Weight, and it's really Priest of the Forgotten Gods, I think, doing a lot of heavy lifting, and even things like Serrated Scorpion, where it just gives you a lot of extra reach. Yeah, we talked a lot about what these decks look like when they always have access to Priest of the Forgotten Gods. We wanted to do it through Fiend Artisan, which is something that some of these decks are also doing. But really, Luris is what takes it to the next level, where you just always have that card. And it's incredible. I played a bunch with Rakdo Sacrifice, going back to basically day one of the format. Very impressed by the deck. And what was most telling was that you just play these games, and you play them in normal fashion, and you never expose your Luris. It's just sitting there in exile, yeah. doing nothing, and you're going about your business. And then when your opponent is finally forced into action by all the other stuff you have going on, you slam Loris, you bring back a priest, and you run away with the game just like that. And it's it's wrapped in just a few turns. And that kind of immediate resource burst in the form of just the Loris body itself, as well as your key card coming along with it, had me super, super high on these decks when we were dealing with day one situations. Now, as people have adapted, I've cooled off a little bit. Well, as it turns out, a bunch of very small one and two mana creatures in a deck that very heavily relies on the graveyard is pretty easily hated out. And yeah. because of Garuda too, you're seeing decks adopt things like Raft Digger's Cage. Uh, Leyline of the Void is good against Luris, but not Garuda. Uh, but you're still seeing some of that in decks like Just Guy Fires, where you know it, it fits the requirement for their companion. They generally do a decent amount of mulliganing anyway. And Leyline, into a lesser extent, Cage, like they're they're just such a huge KO against those decks because half your cards just don't work anymore. I actually think there's a good argument that Cage is the better card against the Luris decks because you are also dealing with Whisper Squad and potentially Fiend Artisan at the same time. So some B plans are shut off by Graft Digger's Cage 2. And when those decks first showed up, they really weren't doing a whole lot to account for it. They had like, what is it, Embereth Shieldbreaker in yep. the sideboard and in fairly small numbers. And that's reasonable. I mean, I don't think anyone was expecting Graft Digger's Cage to be a wholesale inclusion in a bunch of decks. But as soon as that happened, those decks really had a hard time and their win rates plummeted. Yeah, and... Most of the, the versions of the deck play like two Farika's Libation. I think yep. it's Libation, not Liberation, right? I think it's Libation, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they play like two copies of that in the sideboard for... I was playing it for like Uro and Fires and stuff like that. And then you just you naturally boarded it in against Fires. And then you actually just get to Ting their Leyline also, which is 
definitely not the most efficient thing. And you also want it to hit fires, but just a lot of your setups when they don't have ley line are just going to beat fires anyway, as long as they don't clarry on you multiple times. So if you can play cage, I think you're going to be able to sidestep the normal hate that they're going to bring in a lot of the time anyway. But yeah, they also have uh, access to shield breaker in the sideboard too. So like there is anti-hate, but having to libation a uh, zero mana ley line is definitely a thing that is hugely tempo negative, whereas uh, cage versus shield breaker is mostly break even. Right. No, I think that's a good assessment. As far as anti-tech as well, I, I think there's just new paths for this deck, and most of them involve bringing Loris into the main deck and going back to things like Mayhem Devil to get an advantage in the mirror and just play some more powerful cards. A lot of those versions leaning on like Obosh and just getting yep. bigger and having these explosive turns. And I like that as the next step for the Loris decks. Like they were squeezed out by fires. No doubt that's what's occurring right now, but they still have moves to make. And I don't think they're ex excluded from the format. I just think Loris is still going to go down as a better card than companion only in standard. I'm not saying this anywhere else, but only in standard. I think it will eventually met out as a better card rather than just this really, really intense restriction and mostly being cut off mayhem devil is, is the biggest problem with using Loris as your companion. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. Especially when you're talking about mirror matches. I think that the Obosh ones do have a slight edge in mirrors, but I don't think that Obosh really solves the problem of people playing cards that are just good against you and like shut down your engine. So if you're looking to beat graveyard hate, I, I think it's basically move on to a different deck. I, I don't think that there's really a good alternative in playing Obosh or anything like that. I think that there are some things you can do like, you know, maybe you play Knight of the Ebon Legion instead of one of your other, you know, okay. sacrifice fodder one drops or whatever. But like it, that only gets you part of the way there, you know? No, I think that's fair. Uh, there's there's hurdles that this deck has to overcome. And it, like you said, little creatures, graveyard reliance, that's a recipe to be easily hated out. Yep. Uh, right now, I just tuned up Team Erect today, I have a lot of main deck essence scatters. Garuda is kind of a thing, but is also sort of getting hated out. And also people are learning how to play against it, myself included. It's just like, oh, like board in, or at least add sideboard cards, like Heartless Act to my sacrifice deck, and then make sure that I bring that in in the Garuda matchup and just always kill it. So they can't like go off of Spark Doubles and Thassa and stuff like that. And it's like, even that was just a completely viable plan, you know? But Essence Scatter is obviously quite good against that deck. And then the... Shark Tornado, you mentioned, is quite good for the deck. Uh, Yadaro, despite what I talked about on the cast last weekend, does not make the cut because we're not really in a mid-range format right now. So I have not liked that card really in any matchup. But Shark Typhoon Tornado? Is it Typhoon? I think Typhoon. Yeah, because they're not trying to actually copy the, the movie or whatever. Gotta be careful with that copyright law. Oh, Yeah. Dude, the, the the egg would be all over Wizard's face, right? If they got sued for copyright mm -hmm. infringement, right? No, they play they play around it. And I have some flame sweeps in main deck too, which have been obviously nice. very good against the Luris decks. And also, like there are just random things that you catch, right? Like I've I played against like the Winota deck and various Flash decks and stuff like that. And flame sweep is actually just solid. And then cage in the board for Garuda and the Luris decks, and that's been very good for me. One of the things I like about Team of Reclamation is that it feels like it has access to more of its sideboard than is typical in this format. And granted, a companion only takes one slot, but if you want to retain access to that companion as you go into games two and three, you have to be somewhat restrictive in what you're going to add to your deck. Yep. And I, I think Team of Reclamation is the deck that benefits the most from escaping those restrictions. And it's felt very liberating to play that deck and just be like, oh, I can play Graph Digger's Cage and I'm completely happy about it. I'm assuming anytime you bring in Cage, are you cutting your Uros wholesale? I had a little bit of a tension with that when I was playing against like Rakdos Sacrifice, where I thought Uro was still pretty important. The life gain was a big part of my game plan. But obviously, when you bring in a bunch of Cages, you're not going to be able to leverage Uro at all. Is it just a complete cut for you? In an ideal world, I would be able to swap them out, I think. But right, right now, my sideboard has a lot of things that maybe I don't even necessarily need like Fry and Spectral Sailor, Negate, where it's like, 
if I play against mirror matches or like Azorius Control is doing okay again, then I'm going to want those cards. But I'm sure I could craft a sideboard where, you know, I could bring in 10 cards instead of like the six that I'm bringing in and then be right. able to make that swap. But right now I'm light enough on cards that Uro mostly stays in the deck. And especially in game three scenarios when they are actually boarding in like the shield breakers and killing right. your cages and stuff, it's it's not even a lock necessarily that you have Cage and Uro going at the same time. Yeah, my my general plan has been to trim and I noticed I was doing that after I found myself just stuck in a game where I was like, well, if I don't have access to some life gain, I can't realistically win this game at any point. I just have to answer yeah. absolutely everything they do. So yeah, the, the even Scorpions like, will get you eventually. Exactly. So even like bad Uro is fine. Like just three mana, explore, gain three life. I was I was happy with that in several instances. Yeah, I wonder if there's something better that you could have in that slot instead, though. Like something else just to put you out of burn range. I don't know. But like having scatter and sweep has meant that I'm typically not taking a bunch of damage early so that I'm not getting nickel and dimed out. So that's right. that's helped a lot too. Sure. But yeah, they, they have like some discard. Can't really interact with like wilderness reclamation explosion, which is nice because I'm used to having to fight through a bunch of like mystical disputes and aether gusts and stuff like that. And they mostly like as long as you're not dying, they mostly just roll over and die to what you're doing because you just go over the top of them. So it has been nice. Obviously, the the fires matchup is close ish. You know, uh, they have Teferi, which is why I want Fry. But the shark tornado kind of helps there, and yeah. you still have all the gusts and disputes that you want and everything and uh wilt is a nice pickup so i've i've been pretty happy with what the deck looks like so far right there with you if i was playing a tournament this weekend i think team erects the choice for me yeah i definitely mess around i think i have like six luris decks built on arena currently you know so i've, I've played with those decks a bunch but yeah team Erec is the thing that i eventually settled on is like well this is just a good metagame choice, I think. Yep. And then uh, Fires is obviously solid. I they're, they're somehow even more constricted by what they are able to do now, sort of because of Karuga. But also Luris means that they need to play some amount of Graveyard Hate, which is usually Leyline. I've seen some that are just playing a bunch of Triomes and then have Fabled Passage for Swamp that play and play Kunaros. But I like... Mardu Trium for Kenrith anyway. Yeah. And then I think I would just play Leyline, and then you just have some Elspeth Conquers Deaths, Mystical Dispute, War Boss, and that's basically just your sideboard. Seems fine to me. I mean, the deck kind of, it's got a very clear game plan, right? You don't need to get too flashy. Just rely on your power, execute small road bumps for your opponent, and you're probably fine. Yep. And Garuda was... A thing that people were talking about also kind of because of its presence on Magic Online in older formats, but then Magic Online had to ban it over the course of last weekend. Right. And also recently fell out of favor in Standard. But again, it's like hard to tell because people like for the people who were playing on Magic Online, you know, they just couldn't play with it and people didn't have to account for it. So in some ways, I feel like we're going to have to go through that all over again. I think you're right. And here's what I'm going to say about Garuda is that the first deck list I saw, just complete glass cannons. Like they're streamer showcase yeah. deck lists. I understand you want to maximize your combo. But if this deck exists, ultimately, that's not going to be what it's about. Right now, you're looking at the Etherworks Marvel phase when it was just a strict combo deck. We're going to get to the mid-range phase of Garuda, and it's going to be much much more impressive and it's still going to have the capacity to just kill you out of nowhere uh things like yuria can go really well in the deck i talked about just having four garudas in my main deck and playing umari as my companion as opposed to garuda and i understand a lot of the the appeal is just being able to go off always when you hit six mana but you don't go off anymore like people account for that so you need a b plan and i like the plan of elementals risen reef just a bunch of dumb creatures assembling a bunch of value. And now it's like everything in your deck becomes a must kill. And at that point, when you finally get to play the Garuda, it will be enough to bury your opponent, whether it just wins the game on the spot or it puts a bunch of value into play. I, I think it's got to float a little bit more to the middle. And the other benefit of building a deck like that is you get back 
just good magic cards. Like you get Arboreal Grazer, you get Uro back, and those are cards the decks can't play when they're building around Garuda as companions. So those decks have a lot of evolution to do in my eyes, and I'm not willing to disqualify them right now. The first versions, I'll say they're basically dead and buried. People have accounted for them. They look abstractly powerful, but they don't really fit into game plans all that well. I think the second pass of Garuda has a real chance of being a meaningful deck in the format. Yeah, Essence Scatter is still good against your version. Obviously, your deck is all creatures. Mm -hmm. But boarding in things like Cage when you have Risen Reef and Yerok and stuff like that, it's like, eh, I don't even want to do that. Yeah, we're also going to get some Destiny Spinners post-board. So it's not like we're just cold to Essence Scatter. I I think there's ways to play around that. Yeah, I mean, I am definitely cognizant of things like that and Cunning Night Bonder. And like, granted, these are mostly fringe archetypes, but it's like you can't lean on a wall of counterspells really against anyone. You also have to be able to kill their grizzly bear that, you know, makes all their stuff uncounterable. So yeah, got to keep that in mind. But yeah, Garuda is like the jury's still kind of out because of the Magic Online thing and because people just have to iterate on the archetype, you know, like no, no more. Well, maybe you can still play spark double, but like you're not going super deep on like brood moth and charming prince and things like that. Right. Yeah. I always thought charming prince was the trap. And like I said, I like Uriok much better because you can just win off one Garuda plus that very, very easily. It often will do enough to just mill your opponent out on the spot and you get benefits from a bunch of other cards in your deck. And that seems way more promising to me. Yeah, I like that. No, like you, you play Garuda, they have to kill it. You get to mill four, bring back something. Now you have a bunch of fuel for your uh, Euro and everything. So that that sounds good to me. I'm in for that. Yeah. Yorian decks, 80 card decks. Tell me about these because I haven't messed with them yet. There's just no downside. I mean, when it comes to the Bant Yorian decks, your cards are still so, so good. And you just play your four Uros and four Teferis and four Nissas and four Omen of the Seas. And you don't really need to get a ton of value out of your Urian. You're just mostly happy playing 80 cards. And then the times where Urian draws you two cards and is a flyer that is the eighth card in your hand, you're very happy with it. So I have been impressed by these Bant Urian decks. It does feel like the next evolution of the old Bant decks. It's got all the same gameplay patterns. It does it just as well. It's just you fit in a bunch of very good cards and you add an eighth card to your hand and that's going to be enough to bring this deck up to speed with the rest of the format, I think. What about the versions of it that are leaning on like Fires and Planeswalkers or what about this just compared to Fires in general? Yeah, so those are the versions I just don't know enough about. I do have experience with the Pharaoh Bant versions. I don't have experience with the Fires Planeswalker versions. So I understand the appeal I think there's probably some cool tricks you can get up to combining your in with your planeswalkers and just very aggressively minusing them and getting value out of them. But the whole jam a bunch of planeswalkers thing hasn't worked for a while. But we talked about Ether Gust, and really no strategy was punished harder than just like, here's my five and six drop planeswalkers that are very easily answered by Ether Gust. And if right. that card is starting to move from the format and all the things like negate and mystical dispute are being replaced by essence scatter, then you understand why you want to look at these planeswalkers again. Yeah. Main thing I'm concerned about with 80 card decks is how it impacts your sideboarding. Like normally you would bring in high impact things like Ether Gust and Mystical Dispute, and obviously you'd want to draw those cards, but now you're less likely to draw them. Like, how big of a deal breaker is that compared to having this eighth card? Well, I, I think I want to push back on the assertion that Ether Gust is a high powered thing. Like, it's a very good thing. It's a very efficient thing. It's a very diverse thing. Efe- I don't know if it's high powered, though. Yeah, efficiency is more what I'm talking about in, in that specific scenario, I guess. But like, right. even if you're, if you're boarding in something like shatter the sky or cage or ley line or whatever, like a- any sort of card like that. But like when, when you're talking about 80 card clunky mid range deck against like mono red or whatever, drawing your ether gust is kind of high impact because it is probably one of the very few ways that you actually have to interact with them. Right. Well, I agree with that, but I think there's a lot of redundancy across cards in present standard and, Okay, let's just make a a very easy example. Your concern is with swarm creature decks that go very wide. And so you're like, oh, I only have access to my Shattered the Skies and I'm going to draw those much 
less regularly, but there's a bunch of wraths and you can add flame sweep and, you know, deafening Clarion, Cl- yeah, Clarion. And, and time wipe. There, there's just a plethora of options. And that's one of the things about all the cards being so powerful. And it's not only these like broken cards that have stepped up how good they are in comparison to like the baseline. It's just the absence of bad rares where every single rare in a set has some impact and is like a completely reasonable constructed effect, then you can fill out these 80 cards very easily and not really give up that much in the way of consistency. So kind of what I'm hearing is you should front load some sideboard cards and have the same distribution. I think so. I I think that's the easiest way to answer this question. And I also think like you should throw out some old heuristics that you use for deck building and really question how you can maximize 80 cards. And you know, some of that is things like just playing a bunch of Tamios, playing Max Uros, and fueling yourself that way, and being able to play a bit of a longer game where you would deck yourself in a lot of scenarios if you were using that setup <laughs> in 60 card decks, and now you've gotten a few more turns to add to your quivers. So I think that's interesting too. Well, what about relying to some degree on fires and playing 80 cards? Like fires is not replaceable. Yeah, that that's where it's sticky, right? Like that that's the one card where you say. I mean, look at the way real Fires decks are built, right? Four Sphinx Sphinx of Foresight, you pretty aggressively try and hit Fires, and your deck just operates on another level when you're dealing with Fires as opposed to without. So if there is a a card that makes me recant what I was saying previously, it's 100% Fires, and I'm concerned that that effect could be irreplaceable. Yeah. I I mean, to be fair, I think the four-color, like Fires, Euro... Urian decks lean on it much less because all of their stuff mm-hmm. is like castable and relatively cheap and stuff. So maybe it's not that big of a deal, but it still strikes me as like kind of odd. Like if this strategy were good, couldn't you just shave it to 60, not play the companion and maybe your deck is better. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I, I mean, that's I the thing know. about Urian is that like you have to analyze the trade-off and with the Bant decks, I don't feel like there is much of a trade-off in this instance. I, I'm seeing some trade-off for sure. Yeah, Bant, it, it doesn't really matter unless you're talking about those very specific cards like, you know, Dispute and maybe Shatter the Sky that are not super replaceable. But, right. you know, even even in just Bant, you have Shatter or Time Wipe or whatever. And obviously Time Wipe is worse against Mono Red, blah, blah, blah. But like, you're not really s- stretching for like good two drop mana producers or like, solid threats, sources of card advantage or whatever. It's like, you can just play an 80 card deck and your deck looks reasonable. You know, like I have to double take a lot of the time when I'm looking at deck lists, like how big is this? Cause it looks like all these cards are good, right? Yeah. I I don't, I immediately identify them as 80 card decks and that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, What about Winota? I keep playing against this deck and it doesn't seem very good again, uh, very good to me. I think it's one of those things that has a lot of the early Garuda elements to it, where if people are not prepared for it, it is very explosive, it's very powerful, and it folds to a bunch of stuff. And if the stuff it folds to isn't being played, it's probably a fine choice. It needs a B plan that I believe in. Right now, when I've played against it, if it doesn't do like Agent of Treachery stuff, it's mostly irrelevant. I don't know. It still feels very young as an archetype to me. And I see the potential of that card. A very, very powerful card for sure. Yeah. Uh, again, another thing that is just very weak to Essence Scatter and their B plan of Grizzly Bears, uh, at least from me playing Team or Wreck, it's just like, oh, cool. I have a bunch of Flame Sweeps in my deck. Incidentally, that just happened to be very good against you. So, Yeah. Winota is such a strange card and it's so much more powerful than you expect it to be after the first time reading it. Like it, yeah. it just does way more than you think it would and has an immediate effect on the battlefield, triggers a bunch of times. So... I, I buy this card as something to build around. I just don't know if it's figured out exactly how it wants to do that yet. And there are like scaling problems. And now you don't want to be the smaller engine deck. It used to be you didn't want to be the smaller mid-range deck. But this does feel in some ways smaller than Fires with a vulnerability to its interactive cards in Deafening Clarion. So that scares me a little bit. Yeah, I think doing kind of what you're talking about with Garuda where you know, step one is cutting Charming Prince, obviously, but <laughs> just getting to a point where you can play more of like a, a mid rangey good stuff game and not be all in on things like Hanged Executioner and whatnot. Right. And just, yeah, just make it so like 
maybe you play some interaction and you play like some shark nados to, to trigger this thing and just try and trigger it like once instead of three times. Uh, and then you just have some backup plan of like casting your agent of treacheries or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. There's weird configurations to look at. And I would want to see basically like more powerful cards in the deck. That's what I'm looking for. So like, the Legion War bosses are okay, but I'm less excited about. I mean, it depends what version we're talking about. I don't think there's a stop version of this, but I've certainly seen like the Dinosaur Companion card before, and playing cards like that just not appealing to me right now. Agree. What about Flash? Interesting. There's there's good stuff going on. I think like Essence Scatter, Ex- Essence Capture, really good cards right now. And I will say I'm more excited about mono blue flash than I am about blue black Oof. flash. Oof. I've yeah, I've, I've moved along that spectrum, but like if this plan is going to be good, it's going to be good because it closes your opponent out of games and doesn't let them be on the battlefield. And just getting a bunch of removal didn't really impress me when I was playing a bunch of blue black fa- flash. Like it's fine. It's just this deck needs to prey on a certain metagame. And if it's going to be good, it's good because that metagame exists, not because you've added some interactive elements to it. And it's like trying to hold pace with the rest of the decks on power because it can't do that. It's not even close in terms of power. Yeah, but you also have ways to stop their powerful thing, which, you know, in in terms of Garuda, right? Like they're usually just going to lose to a counterspell, at least until they have like Destiny Spinners or Adapt and have more threats and stuff like that. Right. So I don't know. I've I've liked Demir, especially with the sideboard stuff. Like you get Cry of the Carnarium and as many graveyard hate cards as you want to throw at Luris. So at least that matchup is manageable. And then you just kind of bully the the decks that Mystical Dispute is good against. I haven't found a configuration where I feel good about dealing with Priest of the Forgotten Gods, even when I'm in black. It's just if that card ever untaps, it feels somewhat hopeless a lot of the times. So I am inclined to say this is a deck for when there aren't a lot of Priest of Forgotten Gods and leave it at that. Oh, see that like that's weird because obviously if like you're playing a game one scenario and they have Priest and it lives, you're probably not going to get traction. It's going to be really hard to win, et cetera. But like over the course of a matchup, I generally want to play against those decks. Okay. Once you have like your cries, you feel very comfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, I also have uh, two Disfigures main right now, which... I'm sure helps to some degree, but game game one is usually not great, no matter what. Yeah, I, I will be frank. I had none of this stuff, basically. It's just not the way okay. my deck was built. I was accounting for other things. Uh, and basically, like when the sacrifice decks started showing up, I was like, oh, I'm not playing a deck without a companion again for the rest of the standard. And that's when I put <laughs> Demir Flash on the shelf. So maybe yeah, if I had fair. stuck with it, I would have made these adaptations. But some, something like Cry makes a lot of sense as far as turning the matchup around. There's certainly some tension with like your early play a thing, put an octopus on it. But obviously you control the not, of your spells. You can find other ways to do it. Yeah, I'm not leaning on octopus as much as you want to be. I just, I don't think you can, but I don't know. I'll send you a deck list. Maybe you can play around with it a little bit, see if it's actually up your alley or not. I agree that if you just want to hammer the mid-range decks, you just play mono blue. But right. then there are things like Destiny Spinner that might just beat you up. So Could be. Uh, anything else about standard? How have you liked the games? Uh, that's an interesting question. I I mostly like, I don't know, just play magic and enjoy it for what it is. The games themselves, I feel, have felt sort of play draw dependent. The games where either person has a companion varies because if it's Luris, you know it's going to happen. And if it's Karuga, it's like, oh, maybe that's just going to sit there the entire time and not do anything. So it's it's kind of high variance. But like from me playing a bunch of the sacrifice decks, it was, I guess, kind of boring on my end because the games basically just played out the same way every time. So I wasn't super happy about that. And then like the deck building restrictions are cute to a point, but then you find out like within the limitations of what you can do. And it's like, you know, like for example, like Obosh might be the most ridiculous one, right? Where it's like, okay, these are the things that I can play at odd on this part of the curve and this part of the curve. And I guess my turn two is now one drop plus tap land. 
or one drop plus one drop if I'm very lucky. But it's usually like one drop plus tap land, so maybe I can play another tappy land, or maybe it's activate Whisper Squad, so I'll play like the fourth Whisper Squad so that I have it on turn one more often because I didn't want to draw multiples of them playing any of the other sack decks, so I'd only play three, you know? But then like once you get to that point, it's like, well, that's it. That's the one thing that I had to discover, and that's that's just all there is. So the overpowered companions have basically no rails and you get to do whatever you want and just include this card in your deck and then the appropriate i won't i won't call them underpowered they're not underpowered whatsoever but like the more appropriately powered companions have very clear paths that you're forced down in yeah. deck building Some, something like karuga or obosh is just like all right i'm playing these cards now and i don't really have much influence over this and uh, i need to do it because these cards are too good to pass up on so that has frustrated me a little bit as far as deck building goes, as far as actual in the game, in the moment play, it is highly variable based on the matchup, how engaged I am. And some matchups have been absolute tens and I've had a ton of fun playing them. And often I find when I'm playing Reclamation is when I'm happiest. I think those yeah. games are very, very Same. interesting. And I mean, that's part of the reason I'm advocating for the deck because I trend towards things that make me happy and have my play style. And maybe it's a bit of a leak of mine, but like I said, I I have the way I engage with magic at this point and it pushes me towards team or Reclamation. So in, in those sp spots, I've honestly been pretty happy. Some of the sacrifice stuff felt very on rails and very deterministic. Like if they didn't have resources after I got to the point where I could safely deploy Loris, then the game was mostly over. Uh, if they appropriately dealt with it, then I was never in the game. And that was really right. the only thing at issue. So that was tough. On the whole, I am still interested in the standard format. I think it remains solid. I am, I'm certainly more interested in it than I was prior to Ikoria coming out. Agreed. Uh, but it, it, it's sad a lot of the things that I've missed. And I, I wish there was more to do with like the mutate stuff and those those big mythics. It feels like the walls are already closing in. And we knew that going into this. You and I talked a bunch about how Fires was going to be a really, really hard limiter of the format, how Reclamation was going to be a really hard limiter. And I think that's already showing up to some extent. It doesn't mean I'm like off the format or disinterested in it. There's still tons of ex exploration and interesting things to do. It's just not as open as I would have hoped for this set. Yeah, it's weird because we're just like, oh, please change the format a little bit. And to some extent, this set delivered, just not in the way that we kind of expected. Right. And now we're just sort of back to being like, OK, we, we'll take another set now or a rotation, please. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I, I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't think people should be like giving up hope or anything like I do still see some innovation going on and everything. And I think Team Rec is going to be a big part of that because that deck is very customizable. And like right. I said, right right now, Essence Scatter, Flame Sweep, Graph Digger's Cage looks really good, you know? And that might change in the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks. And then it's like, well, you know, maybe we're looking at Bant Midrange or Azorius Control or something like that, or uh, maybe like a human beatdown deck or something. I don't know. So that's I, what's missing. That's what I miss more than anything else. It's just like some beatdown option yeah, that is just yeah. creatures and attacking. And actually, if you look at recent results from the Magic Fest online, there has been a little bit going on with knights, uh, Rakdos knights and Mardu knights, both with some good finishes. So maybe it's time for that to happen. And we talked about how like if fires is only going to play three drops, it has to get punished at some point. Maybe these decks are doing it. Yeah, the, the thing I don't like about that is those decks seem both weaker than Luris and weak against Luris once Luris starts playing a bunch of deadweights. So yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I'm not sure if, if that sort of deck can actually stick around. You, you were telling me about some Gruul deck that sounded kind of sweet with just like three toughness stuff, right? And yep. that that's good against deadweight. Granted, some people have the Myers Grasp Myers or Myers Grasp. Touch. And... Uh, there's obviously Clarion or whatever, but if you are green based, obviously you can get the four toughness or you have the Phoenix to recover from a sweeper and stuff. So I think that just being a bigger aggro deck might also be good in the coming weeks. Yeah, check this deck out. You go over to arena decklist.gg. It's there as Amari Gruel. And it, it is Umari. It's uh, Amari Marauding Raptor. Accelerants are. Arboreal Grazer and the 1-3 uh, 
from the newest set, Beast something. I don't, I don't know the name of that card yet. Hasn't seen much constructed play, but... Uh, yeah, I quickly cut it from my Garuda decks, so yeah. Yeah, one, three, tap it, colored mana for creatures. And then a top end of like Gem Razor and the, the Mutate Phoenix, which you get to suit up your Arboreal Grazer with. And the dream. deck has been nice. Yeah, the deck has been nice, honestly. A, a good way to get some aggression against this small ball disruption that's going on right now. I'm interested in that. All right, so I got some things to try first. Yeah, and I think there are many things to try. We both talked about decks that are existing that are still in their nascent forms, like things like Garuda and Winota both feel like they have potential to expand from what they're doing now. So I I don't want it to sound like I'm naysaying this format. It hasn't come out of the gates as strong as I would have hoped, but there's a lot of stuff still going on that I want to explore. I mean, if, if nothing else, the format did change a decent amount, just not in the way that we wanted it to. So right. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, we say it changed. There, there's five Fires decks in the top eight of the most recent Magic Online yeah. BTG. A Team Erect deck, and then uh, I think two Racto Sacrifice decks. So did it change? Like, that sounds like it could be the exact metagame we were talking about prior to True. the new set coming out. But the, the, the cards are different, right? The cards so. are a little bit different, yes. On to Pioneer, we have Luris Scales, Luris Burn, Luris Auras, and Obosh Gruel. Any thoughts? A lot of companions. And here's here's the thing about Luris and Pioneer and why I ultimately am not sure. Okay, I, I have no idea if it's going to stay in the format. The format can't continue to look like it did prior to Luris's printing. It has to change. Because Pioneer actually, prior to the release of Ikoria, was the closest thing to traditional magic that we had. It was a lot about resource exchanges and small edges and forcing through the right amount of damage in combat with like mono black. And it was a very authentic experience and all, all tiny exchanges and Loris blows those out of the water. You, you trade, you trade, you trade. Here's my Loris. I have all my things back. All you did in the first five turns is completely meaningless. Now we're playing a new game. And every single game will be about that because Loris just changes the way Pioneer is played. So it means we're back to square one, I think, with this format. And if we're going to find success, we have to account for that burst of resources that Loris is going to provide, or we're going to get buried under it. And I am not sure what the result is going to be. I have a feeling the card pool is big enough that you can find ways to account for this card. But the other companions are good too. And I just think it's going to be a lot of companions going forward in Pioneer. Yeah, me too. I, I I agree with you with what you're saying as far as Pioneer being just, it felt like magic. Uh, I don't necessarily like a lot of the ways in which it did feel like that, like in Inverter. I, I, know, I know the numbers and everything. I still have a lot of reasons why I think that a card from that deck should be banned or will be banned eventually or whatever. And yeah, Luris certainly changes things and not for the better. Like most of it is just you ignore the card advantage from Luris because there's not a good way to really outgrind them. I mean, maybe Sultai can do it with Euro and stuff, but for the most part, it's like, well, I'll just play this Atarkas Command creature deck and either they kill all my stuff or they don't. But yeah, most of it is just like, uh, I can't I can't grind with anyone, including the aggro decks, so... Control is kind of out the window and you're just left to swarm people, burn them out or combo kill them. And that's not great. Hyperlinear. The format yeah. gets pushed in hyperlinear directions because fair interaction is not realistic any longer. And it's a little frightening. I mean, do you have anything you're eyeing? Any decks from the past where you're like, okay, I could just go do this. Like, can you bring back Lotus Breach in the face of all this? Or is it just a turn too slow? I, I, I think it might be. Well, that, that's the funny thing, right? It's like, oh, yeah, we can just combo them with like our 4.5 turn 5 combo deck. They're but, turn 4, though. But yeah, like the, all the Luris decks have to be super low to the ground, and they just kill you first. Like they also yeah. have a better goldfish than you do. So you either need a better combo deck or integrate some ways that can just deal with a bunch of small creatures or whatever and just try and like buy time until you can combo them. Like maybe you just have to build a different sort of combo deck. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not big on making predictions, but it feels like there are some fundamental flaws with pioneer after the introduction of Luris. And I am not sure that the card pool can actually account for them. Yep. Agreed. On to modern. Sure. 
Uh, we have Luris Burn, Luris Jund, Luris Death Shadow, Luris Scales, Luris Devoted Druid, Luris Control, uh, Urian Blink, Urian Urza, Zerta Heliod, and then uh, some humans. With Giganta. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you looked at the modern premiere event, all eight decks in the top eight played a companion. Most of them were Loris. This one is harder for me to understand. Hold on. Is is Giganta even good? I have no idea. I'm not going to even guess on that. I, I Okay. Again, the cost is non-existent. It's free. So it's does a, it's a sideboard a, card. It matters. A sideboard card matters. Does a vanilla 5-5 five five that can potentially give you some mana, which I could see mattering, by the way. Like I, I think you can find homes for that mana in some instances. Uh, in you're humans? asking, yeah, I think so. I think so, dude. I'm trying to be optimistic about it, and that it's not just a five five. I, I don't have an answer for you. People have seemed pleased with it. It's being pretty widely adapted at this point, so I'm going to assume it's fine. But the broader point: there are companions everywhere in modern, where the spells and permanents you want to play are less than two mana by default. It makes sense that Loris would be present. Also, it's just like Luris is tricking people into building better Jun decks, which I find hilarious. <laughs> they, they're cutting the expensive spells from the Jun deck as they should have done before. Yeah. So that's nice. So what do we do here in modern? The thought is there should be linear things that don't rely on companions that can ignore the value that Luris provides. Like something like Primeval Titan seems fine. I don't really know why Primeval Titan is completely absent from this metagame. I've, I've seen some Yumori Titan decks. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not sure if that helps or not, but. Uh, I mean, at least, at least it's a different type of deck. And actually, I will say the top eights here are pretty diverse. They have a bunch of different decks. It's just a bunch of companions in those different decks. So I don't, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I am inclined to believe it's a bad thing because in general, I want my eternal formats to provide some relief from problematic mechanics. And I mean, I don't know if I'm at the point of declaring companion completely problematic, but I know that at some point, and maybe it's two years from now, who knows, but at some point I'm going to be very sick of my opponent showing me a Loris before every game. And that's just what we're doing in every game of magic till the end of time. I, and, I ordered, I ordered a, a foil, dope Luris because I was like I'm definitely playing this at some point you know I am I am sure there's no there's no way well there's one way where you never get to play that card and maybe you will get to experience the curse of buying the fancy foil versions of a card but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it I, I don't know what to do with this Jerry what, what's the answer is it just play Luris until it's taken away from you or well, is there still space to go over the top of these fair decks a lot of the stuff that I said in Pioneer applies to modern also where you can't really grind people. Although there is a Luris control deck that won uh, the challenge or whatever. So I guess the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a Luris is a good guy with a Luris. Luris. Yeah. It's a proven fact. You can't argue with that. Yeah. So you need, you need uh Kolagon's command to kill their Luris and rebuy yours and go off with Mistress Bobble. So I don't know. Dude, even even if you know quarantine never lifts or whatever, it gets banned. I'm still gonna goldfish this deck. Yeah, you well, stop what me. you're describing is like the type of magic I flip out over. Like that's good stuff. That's what I want to be doing. I just don't know that I want to be doing it to the end of time, and I don't know that I want all of my opponents to be doing it with me because it's the best thing you can possibly do. Yeah, modern is especially kind of heinous because a lot of these decks were. In the Jun scenario, they were playing Bloodbraid Elf, right? But you're saying like, well, maybe you should not have been playing Bloodbraid Elf this entire time. Uh, Liliana the Veil, I think, is the the one exception, maybe. But yeah, a lot of these decks like Burn, Scales, Devoted Druid. Uh, Burn didn't they, give up a thing, just right, nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, well, maybe you have to fetch a Sacred Foundry a little bit more often or whatever. Or you play the fourth Inspiring Vantage. It's like, nah, like, <laughs> it's just, it's good. It's there. But yeah, like a lot of these decks really didn't have to change all that much because of the way that modern was already. And I think a lot of that is also true in Legacy. Yeah, Luris in the actual non-rotating formats is just 
going to be good in a lot of different decks until something happens. I want to check in with the winner of the Modern Premiere event. A lot of burn in the format. A lot of fair-ish control-looking decks. Guess what shows up and wins this PTQ? What? Ad nauseum. Out of uh, nowhere, out of left field, ad nauseum showing up. Combo Look, deck I, that can fight the super low to the ground beatdown decks. Like, yes. That is exactly what Pioneer wants. It wants a Phyrexian on life angels grace combo deck. I agree. And that is that is the role of this deck. I brought this deck kind of into the limelight at a PT where while Nakatl was unbanned and 25% of the field played Zoo. Yeah. And it was a slam dunk choice. And then I never played it again because it was designed exactly for those circumstances. But something mirroring those circumstances exists right now. And I don't expect Ad Nauseam to have a long run at the top. It's always a flash in the pan when it comes. But if there's a ton of burn, I mean, I was just going to say in your local metagames, there are no local metagames anymore. If there's a ton of burn in your online sphere. Then- we're, all, we're all in the same local metagame. Yeah, it's just one metagame now. How beautiful. It's it's almost peaceful in a way. We've all kind been brought of. together in the same metagame. Yeah, there, there's an argument to play Phyrexian on life combo decks, but it won't last long. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Get your hits in now. Although I, I do think that uh, some of the other options like Zerda Heliod, for example, right? It's like this is, this is a deck that also combo kills, that is also pretty good against aggro decks, also... Fairly good at shrugging off the occasional thought sees and the fact that Luris exists kind of disincentivizes people to play thought sees or grindy strategies anyway, right. except for, you know, when you're talking about the Death Shadow stuff, right? Like they're just going to play them as uh, maybe not even grindy cards, but just like take your combo piece, take your path to exile or whatever. So you're still going to get thought sees. That's just, that's not going to go anywhere, but it's not going to be as prevalent as it was before. And maybe that's the sort of thing that can, can be the, the hero of the format could be speaking of death shadow there was a piece of technology in one of these tournaments i know you wanted to gush about for a moment before we moved on yeah uh i saw a few people playing this uh footfall crater this is r enchantment uh tap to give a creature haste and trample and it cycles for a generic mana i've played architects of will in my shadow decks before to help enable traverse and just give me another semi-unique card type. But in this instance, you have Enchantment, which the deck, you know, basically just didn't really have access to, at least like a good way to get one in the graveyard. So now you have things like Street Wraith and you have a lot of sorceries in the discard. You have Mistress Bobble. So now you have a wide, wide variety of card types. And this is kind of like the Teamer Battle Rage. Like it doesn't double the power or whatever, but it's like a Battle Rage that cycles and does other stuff. So... Uh, this is a, a good pickup for the archetype. I do want to correct one thing you said. You don't have Street Wraith anymore. So I, if, I think that's if you're part playing, of the reason. If you're playing Luris. If you're playing Luris. And I think you have to. Sure, but not, not everyone was playing Luris. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, this is a fine piece of technology. Architects of Will is something I remember vividly back when I was doing Death Shadow type stuff. This works. It's cool. It'll have weird applications. It's mostly going to get cycled, let's be honest. But yes. when it doesn't, it's going to be very cool. Yeah. And it being a cycler for one mana that enables your traverses when your opponent isn't playing things that you can fatal push or whatever is great. And it means that you don't have to play Tarfire, even though a lot of people still border. You should really cut that from your deck. Right. Although I guess if you're expecting like a lot of burn and scales and lures and stuff, it's not the worst card, but it's still, it's, I can't stress enough how bad that card is just in general. Like shock and water is not a powerful card. If you're going to play it at this point, it's seal of fire because Luris can bring that back. So, Oh, that's way better. Do that. Yeah. Although, like I said, the one, the one that I vividly remember that had two tar fires and two craters was not playing Luris. Maybe, maybe there's like one to traverse for or whatever, but it was not as the companion. Got it. But yeah, seal of fire. Luris is nice. It's like a slightly, and a lot of things is nice. Slightly, slightly stronger uh, dead weight. Big yeah. fan. Big fan. Uh, what about Urian? Urian? Urza? Blink, maybe? I want to call it Urian. I don't know if that's right or not. I am into it, but all of these decks are trying to exchange resources with the cat king of exchanging resources. So 
does it do a better job than Loris at playing these game plans? I am guessing no, but I'm going to spend some time with it and find out for sure because I do like what's going on here. Word. And then Legacy. We have Luris Storm, Luris Affinity, Luris, Luris Delver, Urian Astrolabe Control, and Zerda Salvagers with also a bunch of Basalt and Grim Monoliths. Let's talk about that first because I... Did you see Chapin's article? Which one in particular? He's had about a million articles come out over the past few weeks. It was, it was about Zerda and Legacy. It, the, the title was something about how Zerda is going to have to get banned in Legacy eventually. But he just yeah, had yeah. like 20 dope deck lists. Just yeah. off the chain deck lists. Yeah, this card's impressive. And it didn't quite shine. I mean, obviously we were dealing small sample sizes here. It was present in the Legacy metagame. It didn't take the challenge down. It didn't put any copies in the top eight. But this is like the clear keep your combo piece in your sideboard and have access to it whenever you want. And Garuda does the same thing in Legacy. The problem is it's like very glass cannony, but it has a Belcherish feel to it. It can certainly win on turn one. This is a more consistent, more established take on combo. Like these Bomberman decks were good already, and this is just a substantial upgrade. And I'm excited to have a new archetype, which is like clawing into tier one, the problem is tier one moved up to like 0 0.5 by upgrading all these already incredible Delver decks to just preposterous levels. Yeah, dude, Lurus Control, I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for all this stuff. It all looks like the type of magic I want to play. The Dreadheart Arcanist Lurus Delver decks is just like 100% my jam. And there is no question to me that Lurus is too good for Legacy. If you just think about the way you've played games of Legacy over the past, whatever, 15 years, and how intricate the resource exchanges are, and how every thought sees matters, every brainstorm matters, just every micro decision is critical because you need that one last resource in your hand when you finally exhausted your opponent to go ahead and pull away with the game. And Lurish just says, resources, I have those for days, and shows up out of the sideboard and just gets you back in the game with a threat immediately. Like, this isn't Snapcaster Mage getting back a Brainstorm. This is, here's your Tarmogoyf, here's your Dreadhorde Arcanist, which equals, you know, six more cards down the line. It is the most powerful card introduced to the format in a long time. And this is a format that, like, pretty successfully absorbed Oko. Right. I'm not saying it's a good thing for the format, but it's it's there, and it's just another part of the metagame. Luris is much more than that. Uh, this is the most impactful legacy print in I, I, I don't know. Ooh. I mean, since Delver of Secrets. Eh, I mean, you could you could make an argument for Force of Negation, Renin Six, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, Renin, Renin Six. I, I mean, I think this is just headed down the same path as Renin Six, right? Like it. If, it doesn't if, seem like it's going to be long in Legacy. If Ren gets banned, this card should certainly be banned. Yeah, I, I uh, think so. Because, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, well, Luris is legal while Ren and Six is on the ban list. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense compared to each other, you know? So, I don't know, man. I, I think it's cool, but it, it just homogenizes everything. So it's it's not going to do anything good for the format. Yeah, that's that's my biggest gripe. And the aforementioned, like every game of Magic is going to be about this one card seems super problematic to me. And I get that these cards are going to push eternal formats and that's not what they're contemplated for. Like they are contemplated mostly right. for their impact on standard and... Even then, I'm not crazy with this card, but it's acceptable. Like We talked about how this probably won't be the best companion. It's more apt to be a main deck card, and that's cool. I, I think that's a fine place for this to be. I just wonder if it could have been toned down a little bit, so maybe it could have successfully integrated into these formats, and they don't just instantly become about Loris resource exchanges. But there's no question we're there now. I am inclined to, especially in Legacy, play Loris until they take it away from me. I just don't see how this isn't the most important card in the format going forward yeah i agree i mean this is this is another place like luris delver you could probably build a reasonable luris control deck although those decks typically rely on things like euro or planeswalkers or whatever so maybe that's not really doable but 
maybe it is. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of down to try that and just like get in my league while I can before anything happens to it. I think so. I think you want to act fast on this one, Gerald. Uh, but I have to write an article tonight and then I'll probably want to try new standard ideas. Maybe, maybe for my break, I will build a Luris uh, legacy deck and see, see how much it grabs me, you know? I, I like this because you have the exact same problem that I do as you now talk about how on your break or day off, you're going to go ahead and do the thing you do for your job the uh, well, the other days. I kind of I kind of work 24 seven, you know, like I'm not really I off understand. the clock. If, if I'm not playing magic, I'm usually thinking about something magic related. There are a few things like Final Fantasy seven took me away for three days. That was all I did was like eat, sleep, play FF seven. So yeah, I have an almost impossible time checking out. Like I very rarely am not engaging with magic in some form, either playing or thinking about it. And it's something that has to be purposeful on my part. Like I have to say, okay, I'm not allowed to play magic right now. And then I often wander over to my computer and end up playing magic. Like I have Final Fantasy VII waiting for me and I am very excited to play it, but it came out about the same time as Ikoria and now I'm drafting all the time, so <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know when I'll pull myself away from Magic and get in some Final Fantasy VII games. I am looking forward to it, though. Have you started it at all? I started it, and I'm just like in the reactor right now. I haven't progressed oh. in any meaningful way. Oh, right, because you fell asleep with the controller in your hand. I remember this. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Word. Okay, so... Obviously, Pioneer Modern Legacy, there is a laundry list of Luris decks that is not great, but for standard, yeah, there's there's basically one, and it's reasonable. The format is already shifting away from it. Obviously, yep. with Natural Churn, there is a period at which it can and probably will come back, but in standard, at least, you get to look at all of the companions versus just like the one companion that's kind of ruining everything. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is fine. I don't think it is really ideal for every deck to have a companion, but we're not, we're not at a hundred percent for sure yet. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think we'll get there. I mean, you could play a companion in, in team or rec, but I just, I don't even think that it's really good. No, I agree with you. I, I don't really know what to make of this. I still want to give it more time. I am trying really hard to stay positive about it. And like I said, I am enjoying Magic a lot right now. That includes all the deck building I did leading up to Ikoria. I had a lot of fun. I had a ton of fun building around these companions. I have enjoyed a percentage of the games I've played with them. So I'm not just dumping on this mechanic yet. But there's no question this came out of the gate a little bit too hard for us all to be comfortable with. And maybe if we hadn't just gone through the past year, I wouldn't be as gun shy about it. Maybe I would yeah. have a little bit more patience, but having been through once upon a time and having been through Oko, I just think like, I don't know if fear is the right word, but there's certainly trepidation around a mechanic like this. It used to be, we had a lot of faith that, Oh, this would be balanced appropriately and it'll all work itself out. And there's counterplay and I don't know that I share that same faith right now. So I hope to be proven wrong about this. And these are just new cards that we have to get used to. But that that blazing start out of the gate has me very concerned right now. Yeah, I mean, especially in the context of older formats, it's like, whoa, this is this is bad. Like it, it took Oko some time to adapt and get jammed into every format. That's because it was, you know, like kind of weird and people didn't really know what to do with it. Turns out you just put it in everything, right? And wasn't Luris. on my modern top 10 list. I mean, that sounds preposterous when I say that yeah. now, but it really wasn't. And No, that, that's legit. Yeah. At least it made our standard top 10 list somewhere. It did. It, and I think we said something to the effect of like, it wouldn't surprise us if it was just completely bonkers. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, obviously we got, we got some Luris problems. There's not a lot of good issues. I guess you can play ad nauseum in modern and just smush people, but... Pioneer folks, I'm sorry. Godspeed. What about Historic? Maybe I'll check out Historic, see what I can do with Luris. <laughs> Luris Soul Warden. Just well, really, really turn up the power. Luris should be absolutely absurd with Kethis, right? Like just broken. Yes. I saw someone doing that too. That was like day zero of the format or whatever. So I don't remember 
exactly what came of that, but yeah. Like obviously it can't be your companion, but I just think if you have three Lur- or four Loras in your deck, your deck is probably way better. Yeah. I mean that that, that might also fun. just be true in Pioneer. So That's true. Could so be. who knows? All right. Well, every week we solicit the fine folks in our Discord for their burning questions and clearly uh, a lot of people have questions about you know, power creep and companion and is magic dying. Uh, so we selected this question from uh, Katie and I swear I just spent like the last 10 minutes searching discord, trying to figure out how to pronounce your name. Cause we picked Katie's question like a month ago and she explained it to us, but I couldn't find the post. No, I, th- I, I think we got it. We got it right last time. I think she congratulated us on getting it correct. And I think we just said handshaker. Yeah. Okay. So I thought that too, but then thinking it just made me feel like I was blowing it. So I wanted to check and make sure. So anyway. You can leave us a pin this time if we get it wrong. We'll just put a pin up right in the questions channel. So for future questions, we know 100% how to pronounce it. Yes, absolutely. Katie asks, after discussing a lot of fun stuff, presumably, what are your thoughts on limited? This has been my favorite limited set in a while. It feels super well designed. And Brian, I've drafted literally once and I watched my friend draft once and I played zero games. I watched them play the entirety of their draft, but like I have no experience and basically cannot tell you whether this set is objectively fun or not. I have no idea. So take the reins. I think it might be incredible like actually incredible. I have enjoyed it so, so much. There is swinginess to it that you have to consent to. You can do stuff like reanimate your 12-12 trampler very early or 11-11 trampler very early in the game, reliably give it lifelink. That card's Uh, good in living end, by the way. Yeah, what? no one cares about living end. Dude, it's really big. I, I agree with you, it is large. But you can do that same trick in a limited format and you can do it very consistently, which is pretty cool. Basically, I have drafted so many different archetypes and there's sub archetypes and variations and just infinite paths. It feels like every time I start a draft and for a while I was concerned that the red white cycling deck would just be way too good. It is the best thing to be doing for sure. Like without question, I thought maybe it would just always be a mistake not to be in that archetype because it has a lot of very replaceable cards. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's very good, but especially as people are aware of it, like I just had a red white cycling draft. It was the first time I didn't get seven wins, but I lost to the mirror three times. <laughs> so that shows me that people are hunting this deck down now and very willing to play it. And I have found ways to beat it. So I'm pretty comfortable with it being the best thing and it having some counterplay. But on the whole, the potential for creativity and deck building and then in gameplay like there's just so many cool scenarios that come up particularly with the mutate creatures where you're mutating something you wouldn't expect to mutate and it has an unexpected effect on the game it's kind of like all these cards combining in different ways on their face is creating many different battlefields every single time i play a match something i haven't experienced before happens and it's just exciting and fresh and i am into it like i said red white deck a little bit too good the companions busted like just force them if you get a companion pack one pick one build around it you're probably getting your seven wins or three wins however you're playing at this point the fact Uh, that they're hybrid too makes that a lot easier yeah it really does and (laughs) i mean i'm not going to complain more about companions It, it just seems like there was space for them to be weaker and then this draft format would be even better but right now it's basically like you pick it and you win Whereas I wish it forced you into some difficult decisions and forced you to play some strange cards and it does, but it just doesn't matter because the cards themselves are so powerful. So that's a bit of a miss, but it's not format breaking. I will happily lose to companions and they feel more beatable than something like dream trawler. So obviously, I mean, that's, that's a low bar, dude. I I know it is, but like (laughs) that was something that existed in the last draft format. So that's all I can talk about. On the whole, everything feels beatable if you have the right options in your deck. And there's a lot of replaceable effects that you can draft late and have outs to things like the companions or other powerful things. Uh, So I have just appreciated this draft format so much and I'm putting in hours with it. And I think people are surprised to hear that 
I generally prefer limited. You're over, you're a draft guy. 100% always have been. And the people who know me well certainly know that. But I think people who are only exposed to me via this podcast and broadcasting only see me talk about Constructed all the time. And it comes as a bit of surprise. But draft has always been my passion. And it's been a while since I had a set that I am just willing to draft in perpetuity. Like usually I'll have a few weeks of it and then I pass on it and say, okay, I got what I need to out of this draft format. I am hopeful that this is one that could last a long time for me because it has all the high notes of, again, it's mostly about creativity. That's what I really look for when I'm drafting. And I feel that every time I sit down to draft this set. Well, yeah, I mean, that gives you the replayability necessary to actually have longevity with the format, right? Right. Dope. Well, I don't think I'm going to join you necessarily, but I might dip my toes in the water. I don't know. We'll see. What were your experiences as a watcher? Was there anything that stood out to you just seeing the games or navigating one draft? Obviously a small sample size, but I'm just curious what first impressions were. Well, it's it, it was weird because the deck that I drafted was like a, a blue-red spells deck, and then my friend also drafted a blue-red spells deck. So okay. <laughs> that is like the entirety of the knowledge I have uh, for the format. And then he also had uh, like Riel, Narset, and Yadaro. Powerful cards. Yeah, so it was like a, a pretty easy 7-1. So, I don't know. Not not a whole lot happened. It was just like he just chilled, drew some cards, killed his opponent's stuff, and eventually chose a way to kill his opponent. And that was kind of it. Which is like there's nothing wrong with that, you know? But Yeah, so I've had some cool games as like the red-blue spells decks with Porky Parrot and the untapping jellyfish has come up a bunch of times and the timing on like when you mutate stuff is very important and yeah. what to mutate on is always interesting. So it just feels like there's lots of branching paths in both drafting and gameplay that really appeal to me. And that's what it takes, man. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Sounds, sounds like they crush it. That's awesome. It's nice to have a home run in the, uh, in the old arsenal. And this, this does feel like a home run. Hopefully, all these other formats get to that place eventually, but unquestionably, I am in the draft queues. You hooked me, Wizards. Good job. How much uh, is drafting with players affecting that too? Oh, it's. I wouldn't be playing if it was bot draft. Okay. Just yeah, doesn't I, interest me. I, I think it's exploitable and uninteresting, and you can often go down a very clearly defined path. And something is always best. It lacks that self-correcting element. Like I'm here talking about red-white and how good the cycling deck is, but everyone knows that now. That's not a secret. And right. that's going to self-correct to some extent. Yeah. And while you were talking about that, that's what I was thinking too, where it's just like, obviously you're drafting with humans because otherwise this would be a problem one way or another, where it's like the cards are overvalued or undervalued and, right. you know, very exploitable otherwise. So that's cool. Good to hear. I'm, I'm glad yeah. that those, those things like coalesce too. Right. Yeah. Good time for it. And th there needs to be a gambit in things like that, like where, you know, this deck is good, but so does everyone else. So do you risk it and get blown out when everyone else is in the same archetype or do you get that home run 10 out of 10 deck? It's always risky. Well, since I just made you talk for 20 minutes, I guess I'll sign us out and you, you. go get some water and some rest and everything. And I guess I'm going to go pet some cats and that's game. Good luck.